Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith again, and I'm talking all about the Blue Ocean event and the radiative forcing. And as I've mentioned in my first video in this series, I'm wearing a blue shirt uh, to be symbolic of a Blue Ocean event. And my tie is also blue, and there's laser pulses here uh, to, sim to basically represent the laser-like intensity with which I'm... I'm uh, teaching you all about the, um, what will happen with the Blue Ocean event, complete loss of Arctic sea ice. So clouds are key in the overall albedo, as I've mentioned in previous videos. And this is a, if you go to Google Images and Google cloud, clouds frac, cloud fractions over the Arctic, then um, I got, I found, I came up with this plot here, which is very, useful. So this is January through to December, and this is um, a bunch of different studies, okay? But this is the, f uh, this is the cloud fraction, okay? So how much, how many, what's the, if you take 100% being the total sky, 50% cloud coverage would be half of sky is cloud, the other half is clear. You know, 80%, 80, you know, basically four-fifths of the sky is cloudy and one-fifth is clear. So this is the various studies. So if we take um, sort of a mean here of all the studies, there is variation of course from year to year, but you know we might have cloud coverage in January in the Arctic of something like you know 60 or 65 um, percent, something like that. Um, you know as we go through the summer months as the year proceeds, there's open water around the edges of the ice. There's more and more open water. There's more water vapor in the atmosphere. That forms more clouds. It's also warmer. Warmer air can hold more water vapor. So the cloud concentration goes up. It continues to rise and it peaks um, in the fall around September or so with the minimum sea ice, maximum open water in the Arctic. You know, and it, it's over 80% here. It might be 90%. You know, one study had it almost completely socked in. Some other studies, you know, just under 80% or so, you know, 70% here. But if you take the sort of midway between all of these curves, you know, you get a trend like this, you know. Um, and uh, it turns out in a separate paper, which I discussed, you know, in a previous set of videos, the fraction was about 81%. And that, that was pretty consistent, you know, um, and didn't change. Um, much with the, uh, you know, whether there's sea ice or not. Um, and then, uh, you know, as it gets colder, the air gets colder, there's less water vapor held, uh, you know, the sea ice is forming, less open water exposed, the cloud fraction drops back to, you know, about this sort of level, you know, 65, 70%, you know, and then this, so this is a yearly cycle of clouds in the Arctic. Now, of course, the solar radiation, if you remember um, this curve here, uh, you know, this is the insulation based on the geometry of the Earth and the Sun location and so on. So the June solstice intensity is the highest. This is at the North Pole and the light goes down, the insulation goes down to zero at the equinoxes right at the North Pole. Um, and, you know, if we're down at 70 degrees, 60 degrees, you know, other part, lower parts of the Arctic, there's still some light there, of course, okay? Um, so that's, you know, that's important in calculating the radiative balance, if you like, okay? Um, so, you know, and the, the effect of these clouds on the light, um, there's a very detailed PowerPoint study here, and I'm not gonna, you know, it's 48 slides, you know, you could uh, you, I, you can find it by just Googling cloud optical properties and, you know, it's this study or you can find a simpler study if you want. Um, and you can go through and basically this tries to model the physics of the and scattering of clouds based on particle sizes and the angle of the sun coming in and so on, you know, amount of water content, uh, you know, height of the clouds, etc. So I'm not going to focus on that. But what I do, I did show you this curve here. Um, this shows you the absorbed solar um, radiation average globally relative to 1979. 
And this is where, you know, if you take, the, you know, the, basically the absorbed solar radiation is going to be uh, zero in the winter months, no sun. So if you add zero plus zero plus these numbers plus zero plus zero, you get the 0.21 average with no ice, ice free. Um, you know, look how high we go. We go 2.25 here in, in, in uh, you know, it's the peak. But if you add the zeros here for the year and take the whole overall average for the year, you get 0 0.71. But, you know, the summer we get huge warming, of course, you know, in the summer. So loss of sea ice in the summer is going to be, you know, key for determining, you know, jet stream patterns, how much the jet stream slows down extreme weather events getting stuck, how we can grow food, et cetera, et cetera. So the blue ocean event, which is coming very soon, is, is going to be a, an earth shattering event, if you like. Now, in this paper, if you go right down, um, if you go right down, I've talked about this calculation here. Um, and then there's an, um, there's an addendum at the back, supporting information. It's well worth reading as well. Um, but there's a couple, uh, you know, a couple key plots in this. So basically, we'll go down and look at the data. So this is clear sky, so no clouds, clear sky albedo versus the solar zenith angle. Okay, so this shows you, you know, September, the sun angle is, this is the angle to the sun at solar noon. You know, and as we go to September, you know, as we go through the summer, the sun is higher in the sky. And then, you know, and then so, you know, the sun comes above the horizon. You know, it's a sharp, it's a, it, you know, the angle changes through the season. So September and March are up here, you know, and this is as you go here, the angle of the sun is lower and lower as you get to the peak um, months the sol as you approach the solstice. But the sun is still you know, on the horizon with the zenith angle of, you know, somewhere about 30 degrees. So this shows you the um, albedo, you know, if the sky is clear, no clouds, this is the albedo of the surface based on the angle. So I've shown you the general curves for water in some previous videos. This is from Ceres. Um, this is versus the solar zenith angle versus albedo for various amounts of clouds. This is the optical depth of the clouds, more clouds, less clouds. Okay, so you can see that the, um, you know, as you get more and more cloud, the, um, the, uh, the albedo is lower. Okay, well, as you get more and more cloud, sorry, the albedo is, is higher. Okay, this is the more and more clouds. It's reflecting more light away. This shows the variation of optical depth of the clouds with um, month. Okay, so the sun is low on the horizon, getting higher on the horizon, higher on the horizon, and so on. Okay, so you can see that um, under, you know, this is just for the ocean with clear sky. This is interesting. You can see the average cloud fraction above the Arctic Ocean used in the estimate here. So this is June. This is a fraction of clouds, so 100% clouds. Um, versus 45% clouds. So the darker areas are fewer clouds. And this is the um, optical depth. Okay, so what do we mean by optical depth? Let me see here. Okay, this is the optical depth, basically. So if the optical depth is zero, you get um, no clouds, 100% transmission of the energy. All the light from the sun goes to the surface. There's no clouds. Optical depth is zero. Opti as the optical depth increases in, in a non-dimensional fashion, transmission is the exponential to the minus optical depth. Um, so it's basically, optical depth is basically the absorption coefficient um, times the thickness of the clouds. And what you can see is you can see sort of an exponential decline of what the light that gets transmitted through the cloud. So above an optical depth of about five or so, you know, e to the minus five, you know, is very, very close to zero. Okay, so that's what that is saying. Um, okay, so this is, uh, you know, so I've shown you this, and this is the um, albedo for different cloud optical depths, different thicknesses and stuff. 
And basically, the measured and estimated albedo all sky. So 1979 to 83, the estimate was about here. The albedo was about 0.52 or so. Um, and this is the um, how the albedo changes, you know, as we go through the years, there's less and less sea ice, the Arctic is getting a lot darker, the albedo's dropping. Okay, um, so basically, you know, in, in summary, so, okay, so let's kind of try to summarize, you know, what we've seen in this paper. Okay, so, these, uh, where are we here? Let's find the paper. Okay. Okay, so radiative heating of an ice free Arctic Ocean. Okay, so basically, when there's no sea ice, we can calculate how much additional heating there will be on the planet. Okay. 0.71 watts per square meter to the planet. We've already seen 0.21 of that 0.71, so we've got about another 0.5 to go. So when we lose the Arctic sea ice, the warming in the Arctic will be that much greater. Now, in order, if we know it's 0.71 watts per square meter overall for the entire planet, the Arctic's only 3% roughly of the planet, or 3.3%. So if we multiply this number by, by uh, you know, 3% or, you know, it, you know, the ratio of 100% to 3% is about 30, 33. So if we multiply this number by about 30, right, then we get 21, 22 watts per square meter. That will be the additional heating in the Arctic with the loss of sea ice. Okay, but a way to compare it to heating from CO2, planetary, you know, planet-wide and so on, we try to convert it to the equivalent over the whole planet. This would be, and then you, based on that calculation, we can get basically a trillion tons of CO2 emitted being the equivalent. And that's 40, that's, uh, you know, 40 gigatons per year. That's 25 years of heating. And the loss of Arctic sea ice has a huge effect an order of magnitude 10 times larger effect in the month of May than in the month of September. Okay, so in other words, you know, when we lose um, Arctic sea ice, the first blue ocean event in September, the, the sun is not very strong in September, right? And I can go back to, um, I can go back to this plot, right? So, in September, in fact, at the North Pole, the sunlight goes to zero. So that water at the North Pole won't contribute to heating because there's no sun to cause additional absorption, right? But then as you go to lower latitudes, you still have sea ice down to about 70 degrees north or so, right? And then when that vanishes, that effect, you know, in September, that will cause um, the feedback effects and different heating. So... I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining this too well. I mean, I, you know, this is, this is a bit complicated, but I think it's crucial to what, for what's going to happen when we lose Arctic sea ice. So, um, the, when we, okay, so let's say 2022, no Arctic sea ice in September, we get additional heating, you know, North Pole goes into darkness, lower and lower latitudes take a bit longer, but the light and solar intensity is very low. So there are feedbacks from additional absorption, but we're, the sun's dropping and dropping and dropping. So then after a few years, say in 20, say, say blue ocean event plus uh, two or three years, we have no sea ice in, Octo in August and September and October. The stuff in October doesn't have a huge heating effect because the sun is dropped, dropping down to, um, below the horizon. But in August, it has a huge heating effect. And then a few years later, June, July, August, September, October, again, July, you know, as we move through with loss of sea ice in the summer months, um, then we're going to get hit with a sledgehammer. Basically, our climate will be hit with a sledgehammer. Extreme weather events will be hit with a sledgehammer, right? And uh, we'll be rocketing up to a much warmer world. Thanks for bearing with me with this set of videos. Bye for now.